All right. Mm -hmm. So as we come back together, would somebody like to volunteer uh, just a brief word about what repentance means, how you understand repentance? Turn around, redirection. Turn around, redirection. Uh, that's pretty much dead on the money. Uh, repentance, it, the most common term for repentance in the Old Testament is the word sub. Uh, this word appears over 1,000 times in the scope of the Old Testament. And it means to literally turn around, to go in the other direction. Uh, I was thinking about this on the drive, the very brief drive from home over here to the church about uh, how often sometimes when I'm following my GPS uh, and I miss the turn and it tells me to turn around. And I just got this image of my, my uh, GPS going, repent, repent, <laughs> repent. <laughs> so this word sub appears over 1,000 times in the Old Testament. It means to literally turn away and to go in the other direction, to turn around. Uh, I ask you to keep this, keep this image, this word in our brains because we haven't yet seen this word in our narrative. We haven't seen it in chapter 1, and we're not going to see it in chapter 2. We will see it soon. But while we haven't seen the word appear in our text yet, perhaps we are given an, uh, an image of repentance here in this chapter. Anybody want to take a guess what I'm thinking in terms of where we're seeing this repentance. The word distress. In my distress. In my distress. Any others? I think there's an ironic repentance, and we'll get into that as we go. Well, actually, we'll just we'll I'll put my card on the table. I think we're giving an ironic an ironic repentance in the fact that Jonah has yet to say that he is sorry. He has been thrown overboard into the white into the storm into the waves. A fish swallowed him up. He was headed west, but the fish is taking him, turning him around, and carrying him back east. But is this really repentance? Obviously, no. We're not get, This is not repentance that, uh, beyond the, the literal meaning of turning, of being turned around. I asked at the end of last week for you to consider praying this psalm in chapter 2, Jonah's psalm from the belly of the fish, to consider praying the psalm during the week. And I ask you to share just briefly, out loud, here in the larger group, what, if anything, did you notice about the psalm? Uh, Mr. Dr. Shirley said that he noticed in my distress. Uh, anybody, there's anything else that jumped out at you about this psalm, and what were your impressions of the psalm? Verse 4, where Jonah says, Then I said, I've been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. So it seems to me that he, that he was sort of, he knew he was doing wrong. But he also seemed to have confidence that it wasn't the end of the story, that, that God will eventually become his focus again. Mm -hmm. It's very uh, visual or graphic. Um, yeah, the waters compassed around me into my soul. They closed over me. Uh, yeah, this he's really drowning. Um, there's not any sense of air. It's just like you know, the waves keep coming over me. It's not a good place to be. Yeah. To the others. Well, it sounded kind of like him moving. in an impossible situation but he comes back to even though he's in an impossible situation he has faith in God just like in the Greek of Samaria that she was talking about mm -hmm. one of the things I love about the book of Jonah the more I've read the more I've studied this book is that very little appears to be what it looks like on the surface of this book uh, there's images that point to other things in this story or in the larger scope of God's story from Old Testament through the last word of Revelation. Uh, 
there's these images that point back and forward into the larger story of God. Uh, I love the, the multi-layered meanings and the, the imagery, as, you sh as Claudia shared. The imagery of this is rich in this psalm that, we are going, that we're going to work our way through here in just a moment. Uh, there's, uh, as Paul said, the moment of, I will look again toward your holy temple. I think there's a, perhaps a bit of tongue-in-cheek irony in that again, as he was headed west, turning his back on the temple, which lay to the east, thrown overboard, now being brought back toward the temple, uh, headed east. So first, the obvious. Uh, chapter 1, verse 17, talking about the images that don't always appear to be what they appear to be on the surface, or that might have a larger meaning. Uh, chapter 1, verse 17, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights. This again is uh, often understood, and I think perhaps appropriately understood, as a foreshadow or a type of the time that Jesus spent in the tomb after the crucifixion. Uh, but in this this moment, the, the seeming the end of the story for Jonah, uh, God's mercy appears. Even though Jonah had not repented, and I think the question is still very much open in, throughout the entire story as to whether Jonah actually repents at all, God still provides for Jonah. God isn't letting Jonah get off the hook, pun intended. Jonah is delivered from death by a fish in spite of what he has done and what he hasn't done. So let's work our way into Jonah's song. Uh, a brief word first about uh, the historical context of this particular song. There are some scholars who seem to think that this song was not written by the prophet, that the psalm actually predates when this story, this, this book of Jonah, was written. They point to some of the language usage in terms of the Aramaic uh, influences, which wasn't a widely used uh, um, language when Jonah would have been around, and so that points to a composition much later than when Jonah would have lived. The imagery uh, within the psalm points to a time when Israel was perhaps unified instead of the, the divided kingdom in which Jonah lived and operated. Uh, they think that this, this psalm was used by the author because of the, nar the, the thematic narrative, the thematic elements of the psalm match the story, what the author is trying to get across to us. It matches so closely. You see in the, in the psalm the language of going down, of seas, of waves, the waters, the deeps, uh, the, uh, the uh, other imagery that matches the setting or the themes of the, element, uh, of the narrative. Either way, whether it was written by the prophet Jonah, whether it was written before or after, either way, the, the psalm for me is a portrait of what I consider an incomplete repentance. While he is being literally turned around and taken in the opposite direction, this psalm to me points to Jonah perhaps not quite getting the point. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we go. This prayer of Jonah's appears at first blush to be a prayer of repentance but when we dig down deep and we really consider it, I think there might be some things that point to it being somehow insufficient. Let's begin with verse 1. <coughs> From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depth of the realm of the dead I called for help, and you listened to my cry. This is one of the points where uh, scholars, some scholars point to this perhaps not being, uh, having written, been written by Jonah, but perhaps written by someone else and used for this narrative. Because God hasn't answered yet. God hasn't answered Jonah yet. Jonah, this is the first word of prayer to God that we hear is, out of the depths you answered me. God hasn't answered it's possible that we can understand this as this being said in faith, a belief that God will answer. And I think that's a plausible uh, stance to take as well. And I'll leave that up to you for you to decide whether this is uh, Jonah speaking in faith or perhaps this is something else. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, that's something we're going to revisit more or dig into a little bit more as we go um, about the inconsistency of, of Jonah and how that might speak to us today. Uh, there's, we'll actually get to that moment, uh, that point deeper here in just a few, a few seconds. Um, you, uh, the realm from deep in the realm of the dead. In some of the translations, my NIV it translates that uh, this this second line from the realm of the dead. In some translations, you might see the word shale. Does anybody's Bible translation use the word shale here? Mm-hmm. Shale. Uh, so shale is, is the underworld imagery of the Old Testament. Um, it's slightly different than the, the hell that we might commonly picture, the hell that Dante has impressed upon us so uh, deeply of uh, the seven layers or the seven realms of hell. Uh, Sheol was, was slightly different. Um, in, I've read some scholars that say Sheol might be best understood as akin to some of the Greek um, mythology underworld. It was a place of shadow. It was a place of forgetfulness. Uh, it was a place of fading where all the dead go. Righteous and unrighteous, all the dead go to Sheol. Uh, this is the, the common understanding that you might find in some of the, the uh, when we talk about, when you hear Sheol mentioned in the Old Testament. It's a slightly different place than what we might, as Christians, think of when it comes to uh, what happens after we die. Verses 3 and 4. Here we get more of the, uh, we get some of the imagery that Claudia was referencing. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Uh, Again, this is very thematically fitting. It matches the imagery of what we've seen previously in Jonah 1, in chapter 1. The storm, the waves, uh, the ship about to break up. Uh, But this passage, as some scholars have have, uh, highlighted, this points to a potential anachronistic timeline. Jonah, as we mentioned last week, would have been active as a prophet when Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The temple would have been in the southern kingdom of Judah, and Jonah would have been in the, uh, under the authority of the, old, of the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, so it's again, it's possible to understand this line as metaphorically that Jonah is taking some poetic license and referencing, uh, speaking in terms of themes, Uh, Some scholars have pointed to this, say, see, this is why this was composed before or after. Uh, I'm not sure, but it's an interesting thing to note. Verses 5 and 6. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountain I sank down. The The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. The larger uh, moment, this is kind of the turning point of Jonah's song here at verse 6. This Verses 1 through 6 uh, paints a picture of either literal death or of a near-death experience, which fits, again, what Jonah is going through. Uh, I'm going down into the deep. The waves are crashing over me. I went down to the roots of the mountains. I hit rock bottom. I've gone as far down as I could possibly go. And then there's a call back to Sheol here. Old Testament cities at night, when it was time to say the day was done, they would close the gates and they would bar the gates. No one in, no one out for their own safety. The earth beneath barred me in forever. I am in Sheol They've closed the gates. They've set the bar. I can't get out. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. Then we see the the upward bend. He's gone down to the deep, and now it comes back up. But you brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. And I have to ask here, it's here at the bottom of the ocean, if we think of this literally, 
Jonah's at the very bottom of the ocean, and here he remembers God. And I have to ask, how did you forget? <laughs> how did you forget God in the middle of the storm, in the middle of being swallowed by a fish and somehow living? How did you forget? Again, it's probably poetic license, either way. But it, it, this points to a really interesting point, which um, she brought forward. I'm sorry, I cannot remember your name. Stephanie. Stephanie that Stephanie uh, brought up. Only in the most dire of predicaments do we remember God. Only in this particular song, when Jonah has hit absolute rock bottom, does he say, I remember God. It seems a common theme that people, uh, I've heard it described in uh, war narratives as foxhole religion. Bullets are flying, oh God, I don't want to die, save me, I remember God. When things come crashing down, when I've lost my job, I remember God. When the doc says I have the results and they're not good, I remember God. When all my relationships are falling apart and I don't know where to turn, I remember God. In American culture, it's all too often that we see people come to church for the first time or come again to church when crisis hits. Uh, I want to read another poem briefly before we, we have a moment of discussion. Another poem from uh, Thomas John Carlyle's book. The poem's called In Touch. Distress did it. Not Easy Street, not Ackerlin Avenue, not Prosperity Place or Bright View Boulevard, not Fair Haven or the Bay of Serenity or the Island of Tranquility, but off course winds and the straits of adversity and the tempest of disaster that howled to care of this. The deep was round about me, emergency exits were barred. I was pitted against perdition. In a ravenous cavity, I was swallowed up Better late than never, I remembered the forgotten. My troubles put me in touch. Last week I invited us, as we were getting ready to go out, to think of a time when you hit rock bottom and to consider what caused it. Did you turn to God in those moments? And perhaps what prevents us from turning to God before crisis? I invite another moment of discussion to consider those. What? Uh, to think of a time when you hit rock bottom and to consider what caused the, that moment, that come, to, that come to Jesus moment. Did you turn to God in those moments and what prevents us from turning to God before the crisis hits? Discuss. Amongst yourselves. <laughs> small groups, small groups. <laughs>
All right, wrap it up. So I'll share a moment of when I hit rock bottom that caused me to turn to God when I had uh, left God in my past. Uh, I grew up in the church. Uh, we went to a Southern Baptist church as a family growing up. Uh, and after my father passed away, my mother married a United Pentecostal gentleman. Yes, I was one of those people for a while. Uh, shouting, speaking in tongues, acting crazy in church. Um, and we were Pentecostal up until about my senior year. And then my parents just got fed up with church. Uh, I, we stopped going to church. I remember waking up on Sunday mornings and going, God, I really don't want to go to church th this morning. And my parents increasingly going, you know what, this morning I think we're just going to stay home. And so I graduated from high school not going to church. And uh, went through the summer, went to move down to College Station, began at A&M. Moved in with my best friend and another friend of a friend in our apartment, and I was introduced to the wonderful world of beer. 18 years of age, uh, learned what beer was, and I had freedom. I could choose to go to class, to not go to class, and I chose not to go to class a lot. And then uh, six days before my birthday in October, uh, we'd had some friends over. I'd had one beer with dinner two hours before getting into my truck to drive our friend uh, back to her dorm where she was staying. And on the way back from dropping her off because she couldn't drive, on the way back, sober, it had been three hours since I had had one beer, driving back, I went through an intersection with my blinker on and the cop pulled me over. And because I told the cop that I'd had, yes, I'd had a beer with dinner, he arrested me for a DUI because I was underage and admitted to having a beer with dinner. Even though I breathed point zero zero zero, I was still arrested and charged with a DUI. I appeared before the judge and I was going to fight it because I breathed point zero zero zero. I wasn't driving under uh, the influence. And I watched him throw the book at two other young men before me who decided to try to contest the charge and I said no contest community service in $1,500 worth of fines as a college student with no support from home, working for trying to make ends meet. It was pay the fines or go to college and I had to pay the fines and so I dropped out of college. After not going to class it actually made sense for me to drop out of college but that was beside the point. <laughs> but I had hit rock bottom. I didn't know where to turn. My life was in upheaval. And lo and behold, I stumbled back inside the doors of a Pentecostal church, because that was the last church I went to, and I stumbled back inside the doors of a Pentecostal church. And there I reconnected with God in whatever form, however tenuously, for a couple of years as I was wrestling with the call to ministry. It took me hitting rock bottom uh, for me to, to say, I'm going back to church. But what causes some of us to not turn to God until absolutely everything is falling apart? What are your thoughts? Self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. Some of us didn't know. Some of us didn't know. I wasn't raised in a Christian family. So. Pride. 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 Some of us laziness. I don't want to get up on Sunday morning. <laughs> Stupidity. Stupidity. Even shame. Shame. Yes, now I'm a pastor. Go figure. One of the reasons I think why we what prevents us from turning to God before crisis, I think it is all of the above that we've listed. But I think sometimes it's just busyness. Sometimes as well. I'm going here. I'm going there. Things are going fine. I've got to make ends meet. I've got to go into work. 
the kids are sick or we've got to go out of town and need to go connect with friends. Uh, things aren't that bad. Things are, I, I'm okay. Uh, but I've got so much to do, I just don't have time uh, to go to church. I don't have time for God right now. I'll catch up with God later. Which brings us to verses 8 and 9 of Jonah, which I believe is the crux of this chapter, and yet I believe it's full of irony. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. It's really interesting in verse 8. You see Jonah, even while he is in the belly of a fish on the bottom of the ocean floor, pronounce condemnation on all those who worship vain idols. Who's Jonah referring to? Who? The Ninevites. The Ninevites. The sailors. Nineveh most likely, but as Paul said, he might, might also refer to the sailors in chapter 1, which is ironic. They worship vain idols, but they tried to save Jonah, sorry we in, who got them into the storm in the first place. While Jonah, who worships the true God, was ready to write off an entire city just because he didn't like they worship vain idols, but the end of the chapter ends with vows and sacrifices to God for deliverance. Yet Jonah, who worships the true God, has only vowed to give sacrifices. In verse 9, Jonah comes a bit, comes across a bit arrogant or self-righteous, doesn't he? They worship vain idols, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. I invite us to, to, to mark the page where we're on and turn to Luke chapter 18. Let's read another story. chapter 18, and we're going to read verses 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now before we move on, I want to remind everybody who the tax collectors were in the eyes of the ordinary Jew of the day. They were the lowest of the low. These were their own people who were working with the empire to take money from them, to enrich the empire who had conquered them and who, in their eyes, was oppressing them. These are turncoats. These are traitors to their own people. They have defected from the faith and are working with the empire. A Pharisee and a tax collector go up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people robbers and evildoers and adulterers are even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be, will be exalted. Do you all hear the connections between Jonah and the sailors and the Pharisee and the tax collector? And why I hear a note of self-righteousness and the arrogance in Jonah's prayer. Jonah, I think, still doesn't get it. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord, because I don't worship vain idols. Well, actually, self-righteousness 
had become an idol for John. That's a good word. His own. For him and God. He thought he knew better than God. But Jonah gets one thing right, though, at the end. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. One of my favorite lessons that I learned while I was at Duke is I don't get to choose who is delivered or who is worthy of deliverance. I love the uh, uh, the line from or the teaching of Jesus to love God with everything you've got, your heart, soul, mind, strength, and body, and to love your neighbor as yourself. But in the parable that is told right afterwards, the Pharisee goes, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I realized in that that I don't get to choose my neighbor. My neighbor is everyone. Everyone I come into contact with. Regardless of how they live, regardless of what they believe, regardless of where they are from or what they have done, they are still my neighbor. And I have to love them as I love myself. We don't get to choose who is delivered or who is worthy of repentance. We can't earn it. Sacrifices, or in Jonah's case, Promises of sacrifices in psalms sung from the deep can't make us worthy of deliverance. Only repentance can put us right with God. Well, in, in uh, verse 6, uh, in my, I have King James, mm. and Jonah says, Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. So he, he realized he's bad. Even though he's a little more arrogant for the end, he doesn't think he's like the Lord. He, I think he, there, there's a moment there, you're right, that he says, I don't get it all the way. Um, I think there's still something missing from the psalm in Jonah where I, still, where I see that Jonah, um, like I said, adventures in missing the point with Jonah. But unless you get to the point where you realize that you are someone worthy of God's forgiveness. You'll never be at the right place. You've got to realize that the point is that, you know, I'm the worst of sinners, chief of sinners. And unless you get that point where you recognize you have absolutely no worthiness of yourself to be forgiven, you'll never love other people like you think. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is when I was part of the Pentecostal church, uh, they believe that they're the only ones going to heaven. Everyone else, sorry, you got it wrong. You've got a dis different destination ahead of you. Uh, they believe that unless you're baptized in Jesus' name only, not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the, the branch of Pentecostals that I belong to, uh, you had to be baptized in Jesus' name, and you had to speak in tongues to be saved. They thought everybody else was, was, was out. That moment was all that mattered. What drew me to Methodism when I went on a journey of faith with Jackie uh, looking for a church because I got tired of the judgment, the judgmentalism. I got tired of all the rules and the regulations of that church. It didn't seem Christian to me. When I went on this journey of faith looking for where God was calling me to belong, I happened to stumble, we stumbled into a Methodist church on an on a Easter sunrise service, on an Easter morning service. Uh, outdoors in Texas in April that was 34 degrees outside. It happened this year. Actually. We, we, had, we had a cold snap in April. It was weird. Uh, what I would give for a cold snap right now. But what kept me in the Methodist church was, to, in terms of John Wesley, as despite of the coldness outside, it was the warmest service I'd ever been in. To, refer, to point towards John Wesley and his strangely warmed experience. The emphasis on grace and the idea that, it's, that salvation is not a destination, it's not an event, there is an event, but it's a process, this idea of sanctification, that we're continually moving towards what God has created us to be, what God wants us to be. The idea that I still don't have it figured out. It keeps me humble, it keeps me searching and asking questions, and it allows me to be graceful for everyone else around me who might not be what I think they what they should be, realizing that 
perhaps their journey of faith has carried them to a different point. Perhaps they're not as far along. Perhaps they're farther along. I don't know. But to bear one another in grace and mercy with one another, um, that's what I think. Uh, so this idea of I've got it figured out, to me, was if I ever say that I've got this thing figured out, then I have to. I hope that I will realize that I'm perhaps still in danger, uh, that I don't have it all figured out. I don't want to ever get to that point of arrogance. So, but turning back to Jonah's song, I want to ask a question and uh, let y'all discuss very briefly amongst yourselves. I think there's something missing from this psalm of Jonah. Talk amongst yourselves. Is this psalm complete? Is this true repentance, or is there something missing from the psalm? Just 30 to 45 seconds at your table with people sitting on the couch with you. Is there something missing from this psalm? Yeah, he's not saying what he's going to do. I mean, a lot of times if you see a show or something, it's like, oh, if you get me out of this situation, I'll do this or that, right? And uh, there's nothing in here where he says what he's going to do to repent. Uh, you know. Yeah, don't feel that he's sorry. I certainly don't feel that he's sorry. I mean, a lot of us just glancing at him. A lot of it is, I, 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 I
this is a, I painted this as a courtroom drama between God and the people of God. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves the year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the, first, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. If this is an, a, an image of repentance, I don't think it's a stretch to say that Jonah misses the mark on all three. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We could make an argument that Jonah was all about justice. I want Nineveh to get exactly what they deserve. They're wicked. They're our enemy. Wipe them off the map, God. He did want that. He did want that. Yes. So it's possible to say that he got the first point right. But God always tempers justice with mercy. And to walk humbly. And I think Jonah misses the mark on all three. Jonah seems to me to be full of Self-righteousness and a UFO. <laughs> what reaction does being around a self a self-righteous person elicit in you? If you're around a self-righteous person, what is it? How does that make you feel? Well, I, I don't like them. You don't like them. <laughs> no. The 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 easiest image I can think of about a self-righteous person is going to a gym. And working out and having one of the meatheads come up and tell you you're doing that wrong. What you need to do is do it this way. It's you know you got to lift with these muscles. Like, dude, leave me alone. I'm just here to work out. I'm trying to work out my own problems here. I don't need your input. I don't that that idea just absolutely grates on every single person. I don't know of a single person who loves a self righteous person. Like I like being around them. If Jonah is full of self righteous, then is it? any wonder that in verse 10 the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Some translations use the word spew, but the most accurate translation of that word is actually vomited. It's a lovely image, isn't it? Even the fish got tired. Even the fish got tired of Jonah. Like, dude, you're giving me indigestion, man. You're making my stomach turn. I'm gonna, uh, I invite us to a uh, bit of a Bible drill here, uh, going back to my Baptist days. Uh, <laughs> sword drill. Uh, Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus 18, and we're going to read verses 24 through 28. Anybody like to read? I'll read one of them. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws, the native-born and the foreigners residing among you must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out, as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. The same thing that they did, if you do it, I will vomit you out. The self-righteous hypocrisy. Proverbs chapter 23. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 23, 6 through 8. I love Proverbs. Uh, real quick, this thing while everybody's finding it. This is one of my favorite books of the Bible besides Jonah. 
31 chapters, read a chapter a day, you'll read the entire book of Proverbs. There's so much wisdom and teaching in Proverbs. It's an easy way to work through Proverbs. Do not eat the food of a begrudging host. Do not crave his delicacies, for he is the kind of person who is always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the little you have eaten and will have wasted your compliments. And finally, Revelation <coughs> chapter 3. I will read verses 14 through 19. <clears throat> to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. I'm about to spew you out of your mouth in some translations. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. We see images of spewing out, of vomiting, an image of repentance, an image of generosity through these, uh, through these passages. While Jonah didn't exhibit true repentance or sorrow, just promises or, of sacrifices, yet God ironically repented Jonah by bringing him back to square one. He brought him back to dry land. I think repentance doesn't get us exactly where we need to be. I think repentance gets us back to where we, where we began. And we're invited to then start the journey all over again. Notice that God didn't bring Jonah all the way to Nineveh. Nineveh was an inland city to the east of Israel. Jonah fled to the west into the Mediterranean. God didn't bring Jonah all the way to Nineveh, just back to where he was when he decided to run in the other direction. Jonah was then invited to continue and to complete his journey across the dry land to Nineveh. There's a larger sense of irony within this chapter. As noted earlier, Jonah is being repented by a fish, even while failing to truly repent himself. The next two weeks... I think we'll learn the magnitude of Jonah's unrepentance as we continue our story. As of last week, as we're just about out of time, but I want to uh, invite people to share to, uh, as we wrap up tonight. Was there something tonight uh, in our lesson that jumped out at you, something that you saw uh, or perhaps hadn't considered before as we were working our way through the second chapter of Jonah? Or is there even something from from the first chapter that took on even greater significance? Well, I like in Revelation, in verse 19, um, it's after he's talking about the church being lukewarm. Mm -hmm. And it says, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous and repent. And I don't see that Jonah was zealous about going to Nineveh wasn't repentant so he's not really dealing with the he's being like the church in Laodicea whatever the city that was Laodicea yeah good scene anything else I think it's too easy to sometimes uh, I heard some, I was listening to some of the conversations um, as we were discussing through the evening in hearing somebody say that uh, all too often we have this image of repentance of God, I'm sorry, now make everything right. Um, I don't want to say that the Catholics, I'd never want to say the Catholic theology is great, but I think there's something about penance uh, that could, perhaps could be learned um, 
repentance isn't just an, an act of saying I'm sorry. It's an act of a change of heart. It's sometimes changing our heart means undoing some of the things that we've done. It means learning new habits or new ways of thinking. Um, if I've wronged my brother, if the thing that I need to repent of is I have slandered my brother I have, or my sister, I have said some things wrong, I have made them look bad, I've gone out of my way to hurt them, uh, there's a teaching of Christ that says, uh, if you have something against your brother, leave your offering at the altar, go and be reconciled, and then come back and make your offering. I have to be right with my brother before I can be right with God. Jonah still doesn't want to be right with Nineveh. Jonah still doesn't want Nineveh to come to faith. He doesn't want Nineveh to repent. Jonah still has something against there. He's trying to make a, a vow of sacrifice, but Jonah still hasn't got there yet. Um, even if he made a sacrifice, I think Micah would say that, that you're making the wrong sacrifice. Uh, there's something else that God wants. For next week, I invite you to read through chapter 3. And there's something I want, uh, I invite you to pay attention to how the actions of the Ninevites and what Jonah did differ from each other. Think about what repentance looks like and where you see it in chapter 3. Think about how Jonah and Nineveh looked different about how they approached repentance <coughs> and how they came before God. And think about what repentance looks like and where you see it in chapter 3. I thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I hope you've heard something that perhaps sparked a thought uh, that uh, made you look at this book a little bit different and perhaps made us look at our faith walk uh, with God and with each other perhaps a little bit different as well. Will you pray with me as we close up tonight? Father Almighty, thank you. Thank you that you deal graciously with us. That you're always willing to extend grace to those who repent. We pray that as we continue our journey through the book of Jonah, that you will bring us back all safe again next week uh, to continue this discussion uh, and to learn more about what repentance looks like, what evangelism looks like, uh, and who you are more deeply. We pray for each other and for our church and for our world. All these things in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.